Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week we're going to start out with uh, three questions from Corey Donaldson, who leaves uh, comments at my blog at stevelikestocurse.com. Uh, first question, what is your favorite Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker song? Second question, what Steven Soderbergh movie do you like? Third and final question, do you like seafood? Well, uh, first, my favorite Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker song is uh, Southern Accents. I like many Steven Soderbergh movies. My favorite is probably Bubble. And uh, finally, do I like seafood? Yes, I am from Maryland. I kind of have to like seafood. Uh, we all love crab. We all, even even those of us in Maryland who live a little bit of distance from the Chesapeake Bay, we still we're brought up eating crab. Crab is like the state thing here in Maryland, and uh, that's how that's how I would know. You know, that's how all of us, not just me, all of us in Maryland. If if aliens ever invaded. Uh, and shape-shifted to look like humans, and they pretended to be from Maryland, and then they didn't like crab, that would give it away, like, immediately. It would be like the reverse invasion of the Body Snatchers thing, where all of the regular people would immediately recognize the alien. And we would probably go, Aah! you know, because we do that anyway in Maryland. It's just a thing. Jaybird196, if you had to fight a superhero, who would you fight and why? I think my best shot would probably be uh, the Atom, if I could squish him before he got too small, you know, like if, if he gets small enough that he can like jump into my ear and start fucking with my balance or my nervous system, then I'm probably screwed. But if I can just fucking smash him when he's, when he, when he's shrinking down to about that big and I can just go, BAM, gotcha! I think, I think that might be my best shot. Quetzalcoatl 2012. I was arguing with a friend of mine on what makes a story fantasy or sci-fi. He thinks Star Wars is sci-fi because it's in space. That's about it. I say sci-fi should be a very restrictive term applied when the plot is directly tied to the technology or focused on the direct consequences of that technology. This makes Star Wars, Alien, and even Looper, Bruce Willis even says, who gives a shit how it works, fantasy, and Star Trek Minority Report, and Jurassic Park sci-fi. What do you think? I tend not to fret too much uh, over those kinds of distinctions, but I, I guess if I had to draw a line, I would, I would agree with you. I mean, I, do, I, I tend to consider sci-fi to be more on the serious side. Sci-fi is more trying to make a point about the dangers of technology or about human nature using a future setting or, a, or a, a, a more technologically advanced or a more interstellar setting to make the point, to, to tell it as an allegory. Uh, whereas something like Star Wars, and I would even argue Star Trek as well. I mean, I really don't think, even though Star Trek is uh, supposedly uh, set in the future of humanity and it has you know it's based on advanced technology star star trek is essentially a fantasy i mean there's no there's no plausible that that is not a plausible future star trek is not a plausible future uh so i would i consider all of that stuff just i, I star wars and star trek battlestar galactica uh you know that's just space fantasy to me uh space fantasy and and but i like i said i, I don't really hurt myself over those kinds of distinctions. I love Star Trek, I love Star Wars, uh, I don't really care whether it's science fiction or sci-fi fantasy or space adventure or whatever. I, I mean, I don't really care what, what you call it, as long as it's good. Ziffelmeyer, question, what do you do when your sweet, lovable, gray-haired grandmother is a racist? You put her in a nursing home and you don't visit. And uh, an Entropy fan in the comments page also had a a good suggestion for that. He said you eat her swastika-shaped cookies and you tell her they're delicious. So, either way, you either abandon grandma to die or you just play along and just tell her that she's great. And then you wait for her to die so you can end that cruel, horrible charade. Leonard Euler 1, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the works of Carl Sagan and what impact has he had on your views on atheism, science, life in general, etc.? I think Carl Sagan has probably had more impact on on my life and my views than any other person other than people that I've known personally. I mean, I saw a rebroadcast of Cosmos when I was maybe four or five years old, and it changed my life. I mean, I was, I was already interested in science. I was interested in science and space and the stars from a very, very young age, 
but uh, seeing Cosmos on TV and having Carl Sagan explain these very complex concepts in a way that was understandable and yet was not lowest common denominator and pandering and simple-minded just really struck a chord with me and really just 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 uh, lit up my brain as the invisible man might say and Carl Sagan is just for me he's I, I, w I would call him one of the big three for me in terms of just influence on my intellectual development and my opinions and my philosophy the other two of the big three would be Voltaire and Thomas Paine so I would put Carl Sagan in very rarefied air uh, and I have a lot of his stuff here I mean, you probably maybe you can't make it out it depends on how big your screen is but uh, and I could zoom in but I'm not going to uh, on the bookshelf back there there are Carl Sagan books I have uh, several editions of Cosmos I have uh, Billions and Billions, I have The Demon Haunted World, which is one of my favorite books ever. That's probably my favorite Carl Sagan book. Uh, and it, I, I, I just can't overestimate, I can't overstate how important Sagan's work has been to me personally. Next up from Stimuli, Dear Steve. You know what, I'll tell you another thing about Carl Sagan. <laughs> I'll get to your question in a second, Stimuli. Um, uh, the other thing about Carl Sagan that was so important to me was he was the first person that I ever saw that, that showed me that scientific knowledge was beautiful. Not just, that it wasn't just a way to figure things out. It wasn't just an investigative tool. It wasn't just, just a, a, a collection of facts. Although it is all of those things, and all of those things are very important. It was beautiful. You know, it was the world, the, the physical universe that we can see and discover and comprehend through science is absolutely beautiful. And when you let go of, of a religious belief, you're not losing anything. You know, a lot of people, when I talk to religious people and, and we discuss religion and atheism, a lot of times people will, will express this idea that, well, the universe without God is just so cold and so hopeless and, and there's just no poetry to anything anymore and every, nothing has any meaning. And, and I have found exactly the opposite to be the case. To me, when I accepted that there was no God, that the claims of religions were false, that all we have is the physical, material, visible, understandable, scientifically verifiable universe, I, things seemed so much greater to me then. They didn't seem smaller, they didn't seem insignificant, they didn't seem meaningless, they seemed just beautiful to me in a way that they never had been when I was clinging to a religious belief. Because the universe is so much bigger than any religion has ever told us it is. The universe is so much bigger and more beautiful and more powerful and more mysterious and more awesome than any religion has ever told us. And Carl Sagan was the first person that I ever saw who brought that home to me, who showed me that the, that the real world, the natural world, at all levels, from the universal level down to the smallest quantum level that we can, we can see, that it was beautiful. It was so beautiful and so wonderful and so fascinating and that there was such poetry and 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 so many reasons to be awestruck in the real physical universe and and uh, Carl Sagan's work is what opened that up to me is what first showed me that um, and maybe I, I, I'm, I, I feel like I had to add this bit because I think I probably owe him and owe his work more for that than for any of the other stuff that I mentioned so anyway Sorry about that, Stimuli. Back to your question. Stimuli says, Dear Steve, if you were chosen to direct the next big superhero movie and you were allowed a reasonably unlimited budget, which superheroes would it be about and what would it be like? Here's the catch. It can't be Superman or Batman, except for cameos. I would do Captain Marvel. Uh... Shazam, DC's Captain Marvel, Billy Batson. That's what I would do. I would love to do a Captain Marvel movie. And I would love to do it. I would love to try and sort of, It's not usually my style, but if I were doing Captain Marvel, I would want to maybe channel a little bit of Joss Whedon uh, without the self-satisfaction, hopefully. <laughs> without the smug self-satisfaction, hopefully. But that, that, that balance of drama and comedy, I think, would be perfect for for a character like Captain Marvel where the, the character 
I think to work, he can't be too dark. He has to be whimsical. He has to be lighthearted. He has to be fun. Uh, but you also want to have some emotional weight to the proceedings. And Captain Marvel is just such a great character that has never really been done justice in the modern age to my satisfaction and has never been adapted outside of comics at all really I mean it's, there have been Saturday morning shows there have been some Captain Marvel adaption but never like a major there's never like a big budget Captain Marvel movie uh, there was a serial back in the 40s which is fun just for quality cheese because it's so shoddy and so poorly made and, and just so fucking bad but uh, I would love to do Captain Marvel I think that would be great Varmint Coyote if someone asked you what the worst thing you ever did was, would you be able to answer right away? Yes. Pimp Daddy Destro. What a great username. Pimp Daddy Destro. I put this comment up on one of your old Five Stupid Things videos, but I just found your You Had to Ask series. Do you think the Federal Reserve is draining our economy like the conspiracies claim? Also, what the fuck is up with our national debt? What would happen if we actually tried to repay all of our national debt on some Ron Paul shit? Would we go into a super depression? First of all, no, I don't believe that about the Federal Reserve. Uh, I don't think the Federal Reserve is the evil boogeyman that a lot of libertarians and a lot of crazy Ron Paul people think it is. The Federal Reserve, uh, on balance, is a, an incredible good in our economy. Uh, before we had the Federal Reserve and in the periods of our history where we did not have a national bank of any kind, uh, the economy was much more volatile, was much more prone to wild fluctuations, uh, bank panics, uh, currency panics, depressions and recessions, that, that kind of stuff. We think that happens a lot in our era. We, we think that recessions happen you know, fairly regularly for, for us. But uh, the economy is so calm now compared to 150 years ago. And, and a big reason for that is that we have a Federal Reserve that is dedicated to setting our policy and to, and to directing our economy. And, uh, I mean, and look, it's, 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 it's not a new idea. People talk about the Federal Reserve as if it's some new idea that the bankers all got together and imposed on the, on the people. Uh, it's actually the third national bank that the United States has had in its history. And the National Bank, even though it was a controversial idea when, it, when the country was being founded, not all of the founding fathers were down with the idea of a national bank, not at all. But it was an idea that some of the founding fathers had. George Washington, the first president of the United States, the founder of our country, the father of our country, was in favor of a national bank. So, no, the Federal Reserve is not some horrible, evil, evil force. I'm not going to say that everything it does is good. I'm not going to say that I, I don't wish maybe it could be a little more transparent sometimes. But it's not, I'm, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the Federal Reserve. And I'm not, like, eyeing the Federal Reserve with some suspicious look out of the corner of my eye. I'm just, it, it's, it's, that is conspiracy theorist bullshit. And as for paying back the national debt, we couldn't pay the national debt back all at once, obviously. That would, that would wreck the economy because we don't have that much money. We would have to pay it back in installments probably over a couple of hundred years uh, because it is, it is ridiculous. It's a huge amount of money. Mr. Friggin' Awesome asks, would you equate the belief in an imaginary friend, regardless of age, with the belief in a deity? And if so, how would you effectively implement this in an argument against theism or theists, whether it attacks the existence of God or the immorality or dangers of religion? I think that the belief in an imaginary friend is a good analogy, but I don't think you can equate a person's belief in an imaginary friend with a with an individual person's belief in God. I think you have to make it an analogy where uh, you you compare the belief in an imaginary friend of an individual to the belief in gods by populations, by large groups of people, by even by humanity in general. You could say that our gods were our gods were imagined by us, by our ancestors in the early more primitive, more scientifically ignorant phase of our human development, just as most children have their imaginary friends in their early years, when they're more imaginative, when they're less grounded in reality. Um, I think it's a good analogy. And then you can say, but you know, when you were a kid, you had an imaginary friend, and then when you grew up, you didn't have your imaginary friend anymore, did you? You know, 
And now it's time for us as a society to grow up and let our common imaginary friends go. I think that could be a good argument. I don't, think it, I don't know if it would be very persuasive. It might be persuasive to some people. But I do think it's a good argument. And it's a good illustration of how the belief in, in God's works, I think. The Eckroll asks, which do you like better, MST3K or Rift Tracks? Well, that's easy. It's MST3K. Uh, Rift Tracks is great. I love Rift Tracks. I'm very grateful that Rift Tracks is there. And also Cinematic Titanic, uh, which is another group of MST3K alumni that is doing their own thing and, you know, reviewing bad movies. And actually, Cinematic Titanic is a lot closer to how, uh, uh, how MST3K was in the sense that uh, they're all it's of course and then when when they do Rift Tracks live it's kind of it's kind of the same thing as Cinematic Titanic and Rift Tracks live are pretty much the same thing now just with different people but they, you know they Rift Tracks began as M MP3 commentaries and you could download them for any movie and they still do that it's still the main thing you can you can have the uh, the MST3K style commentary on any movie that they would do you know because you're only buying the commentary and then you provide the movie so they don't have to get copyright clearance for anything and that's awesome but uh... you know this part of what made MST3K so special was that they were doing it with such terrible movies it wasn't just any movie it was you know the cheesy old horror movies or sci-fi movies and they were corny and they were low budget and they were you know just really bad but in a charming way and uh... cinematic titanic has a lot more of that personality with it so and I like both. I love both. I think Joel, who is in charge of Cinematic Titanic, is great. I think uh, Mike Nelson, who is in who is the in charge of Rift Tracks, is great. Uh, I think the people involved on both sides are all funny, and I like both projects. But yeah, MST3K is better <laughs> than both of them. I mean, MST3K was it because it wasn't just the commentary. It wasn't just the feeling of watching the movie with these people and laughing along with them and getting the funny jokes. It was also the characters. And, you know, the robots, the puppets, the, the, the weird jokes that they would have in the host segments in between movie segments. I mean, all together, it's MST3K. It was just, that's one of my favorite shows ever. And as much as I love having riff tracks around and also cinematic Titanic, it, they, it, nothing quite takes the place of MST3K. And that was the last question. Why don't we do a shout-out before we get out of here? The shout-out this week goes to Atheist Explains. Atheist Explains has a really good channel, and he's doing a series now on mere Christianity. And some of you may recall that last year I did a series on mere Christianity. It was the second book that I gave the An Atheist Reads treatment to. And that's actually how I found Atheist Explains channel. He started doing his own uh, series on uh, mere Christianity from an atheist perspective and then someone told him, hey, you know, uh, Steve Shives already did this. And he actually sent me an email. He actually wrote me and said, hey, are you cool with me doing this? which I thought was so classy because there was he was under no obligation to do so I would not have given him a hard time I am not you know I mean I'm not the first person to do those sorts of things I actually stole the idea from Becca uh, Faith Fights Fact after she closed her channel she was doing uh, a, a series called An Atheist Reads the Case for Christ and after she closed her channel I kind of took the idea and the title and just did my own thing with it and uh, you know and I mean, I'm not the first. I'm doing uh, a purpose-driven life now, and I'm not the first person to do that. Angie, the anti-theist, did that. So you know, if anybody wants to do their own an atheist reads Christian apologetics book, by all means. I mean, you don't have to ask my permission. I'm not the one who came up with it. I'm just doing my thing. Uh, so, but he was classy enough to write me and to say, you know, and he even said, look, if you have a problem with it, I'll stop doing it. I'll take the video down. And I mean. That was just really cool. He had there was he did not need to do that. I would not have given him a problem with that. I would not have cared. Uh, but just to be sure, he he wrote me, and I thought that was really cool. And his series is really good. It's it's and it's a lot different from mine, which is why you shouldn't be afraid of doing your own thing. If if someone else has done it, but you have your own take on it, you should do it. And Atheist Explains is doing his own mere Christianity series. His videos are shorter than mine generally, and they focus more on like the general overarching topic of the chapter of the book uh, whereas mine was more detail oriented more of like a, a reading from beginning to end and commenting on things as I went along he takes more of the whole picture and dissects what 
Lewis's main argument is. So check out his channel, Atheist Explains. He has my seal of approval. Not that that means jack shit, not that he needed it, or sought it, or wasn't doing great <laughs> without it, but he's got it. So check out his channel, Atheist Explains. That is it for this week. Uh, I will be back to do this again next week to answer yet more of your questions, assuming, of course, you have some questions for me, because for me to do this, of course, you have to ask. It is actually implicit in the very title of the series. Uh, so if you have a question for me about anything at all, anything you want to know, anything you want me to offer an opinion on, whatever, no topic is off limits, nothing is too personal. Uh, leave a comment on this video, and I point down because everybody does that. Um, Leave a comment on this video, because if I don't do this, you won't be able to find the comment box. Where is the comment box? He didn't indicate a direction. Uh, leave a comment on this video, ask your question, and I will answer as many of them as I can in the next episode of this series, which will be next week. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for the questions. As always, I had more questions this week than I could use, which is awesome. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate you watching, and I will see you next week.